These are amazing. I can't believe we're sitting at a table in a moving vehicle. Ooh, informational travel pamphlets. I want to read them all and gain their travel knowledge. Kid, those useless pamphlets have never helped a single person. The only wrinkly old travel guide you'll need is me. No. Roadside attraction is to Gravity Falls what an episode like Fly is to Breaking Bad or Christopher was to The Sopranos. The most divisive and controversial episode of the whole show. It's constantly regarded by fans as the show's worst. Be it from the many episode tier lists on Reddit putting it down at the bottom, rants, reviews, and more about it over the years, YouTubers had, who have expressed their dislike to it, and more. Personally speaking though, Roadside Attraction is actually one of my favorite Gravity Falls episodes. Now, before you get your pitchforks, hear me out. I get the flaws that this episode has. Hell, a while back I planned to make a video going into the defense of Roadside Attraction and tackling the three million points you often see fans hate this episode for. Those being the placement of the episode, the return of Dipper's crush on Wendy, and the out of nowhere relationship between him and Candy being pushed and then instantly killed. But I never did make it, given I know there's more problems to that episode than just those three points, and shipping is not a can of worms I'm in the mood to open. However, I love this episode for the beauty and simplicity of it. It's the only Gravity Falls episode that's properly set outside of the town of Gravity Falls. Not through a flashback or a vision or a dream, but literally, the characters are outside of the town. We see the rest of the beauty of the Oregon state. It's one of Gravity Falls' best episodes visually, and alongside that, I did love the bonding that Dipper and Stan had in this episode, despite the flawed methodology that they had for trying to pick up girls. And I mean, it shows in how RA is not even the lowest rated episode of Gravity Falls according to some sites like IMDB. There, Boys Crazy is the lowest rated episode, with RA barely making it into the bottom 10. Also side note, it is also higher rated than the Owl House's lowest rated episode, yet still lower than Amphibia's. I don't know about you, but it's nice seeing Amphibia get the love and appreciation it always deserved. Also, as a sucker for road trip episodes, this is a no-brainer fun adventure for me. And of course, it's the last one that the show has before Weird Weirdmageddon starts and the end of Gravity Falls begins. However, it's also the road trip aspect of this episode that is a point of criticism for some, and it's regards to one of Roadside Attraction's biggest issues, which we're going to discuss. And that is placement. You see, many fans find issue with why Stan takes the kids on a road trip outside of the town when in the last Mablecorn, literally the previous episode of the show, they spent it bill proofing the shack so that he could not get to them. Was all that for nothing then? Add on the fact that Ford is never even mentioned in RA, let alone seen, and you can forgive the fact that a great deal of fans feel that this is a story meant for earlier in season 2 that was placed purely in between two plot critical episodes for as what Alex Hirsch said, a cooldown episode before things went off the rails. Of course, like I said, I'm not going to tap into the shipping aspect of the episode, but I do find this point rather interesting about the RA hate. Why go on a road trip right after you made your home safe from the dream demon tormenting you? And where is Stanford, the author of the journals, this new main character who we're supposed to get to know well in just 9 episodes before the end and he isn't even in one of them? It makes no sense at face value. And yet, there is a simple line that exists which, when you look at it with the critical thinking mindset that Gravity Falls fans were known for having back in the day, you begin to realize that this road trip may have actually been one of the smartest chess moves made throughout the show by Ford in his battle with Bill. So let's do some old school Gravity Falls fandom researching and theorizing, eh? Now what is this line that I'm referring to that changes everything? Well, it is found in none other than the source of many of the biggest theories fans still discuss. Journal 3 This line is found towards the end of the journal once Ford has possession of them again and is on the page right after where we learn Dipper's real name, which, in case you are still living under a rock and don't know, is Mason. Anyways, on that page, titled The Rift Containment Unit is Cracking, Ford writes the following. I suggested it would be a good time for Stan to take the kids on that road trip he had been talking about while I puzzle over this problem. If the unit breaks, all the madness of Bill's nightmare dimension will spill into ours. The single paragraph explains a ton to us and puts to rest one major topic of debate in the fandom. Roadside Attraction is set exactly when it aired. This was not a season 2 A story told in season 2 B. This was an S2B story from the start. 
and it was all because of Ford. Despite not being in the episode at all, he was the one who practically orchestrated it by telling Stan to take the twins on his road trip. And the reason we don't see him is because he spent the entire time trying to find a solution to the rift. Now of course, we gotta be real for a sec, as what we basically are seeing here is a classic case of a retcon. When it first aired in 2015, fans did not know exactly when Roadside Attraction took place because it was left so vague. We just knew it was likely set after the events of Into the Bunker because Dipper is still getting over Wendy, but because of Ford's absence, it was very debatable if it was a pre or post novelty seems that story. But the simple passage retcons the story to now without debate, being set exactly and canonically as and when it aired. But that adds on to it another question which still needs answering. Cause now that we know Ford was behind Roadside Attraction, and that this episode is indeed set after the events of The Last Mablecorn, why did he want them all out? Why did Ford need to be alone in order to find a fix for the rift? Why did he send Dipper, Mabel, and Stan away when they had just built proof the shack? Well, if you allow me to delve into a bit of old school Gravity Falls theorizing, using knowledge theorists of old school only wish to have had, what if Ford didn't build proof the shack to protect the family, but as an insurance to protect himself? What if his reasoning for having Stan take the trip was not so that he could be alone in solving the rift problem, but because he wanted them safe? What if Ford knew the end was coming, and so he made sure no one he cared for would be in harm's way? What do I mean by this? Well, consider the following. Why do Gravity Falls fans feel so confused about the idea of going on a road trip when you just built proof the shack? Because we are meant to believe that being on the inside of the mystery shack is now the only place you are safe from Bill, that outside of it, you are susceptible to his tricks and manipulation. But what if you're outside of Gravity Falls itself? Outside of the barrier, the natural law of weirdness magnetism. Remember, Gravity Falls is a weirdness magnet. It attracts and keeps weirdness inside of it. That exact same barrier is what kept Bill inside the confines of the town during Weird Mageddon. And try as he may, he could not escape. Weird Mageddon may have begun, but it was only a lightning strike that started a fire in the forest, on an isolated island in the middle of a lake. And that's the importance of this moment. Remember, where was the gang going on their road trip? They were not in Gravity Falls anymore. They were out and about in the greater state of Oregon. They were not in the confines of Gravity Falls or the barrier. They were therefore free of Bill Cipher. If Bill could not escape Gravity Falls near Weird Mageddon, he could therefore not reach anyone who else who was outside of the town's barrier via the mindscape, including the pines. So consider this therefore. What if Ford, knowing the rift was breaking, gives his approval to Stan to take the kids on the road trip? With them gone and past the barrier that so far only he truly knows about, he can now begin to safely find the solution for the rift. But if the worst was to happen, and the rift broke before he could find a fix to it, and Weird Mageddon starts, at least he knows that his family is safe and far away from the town, and Bill cannot get to them. But if your goal is sending the family away, why didn't Bill proof the shack? Well, think about it this way. The mystery shack may have been the best place to be within the barrier during the apocalypse due to Stan's prepping and Ford's technology there, but it was a finite oasis in a bordered hellscape. Your goal if stuck in the shack is not to ride out the storm, but to use it as a temporary refuge. Ford had the shack protected so that if Weird Mageddon began, he could use it as a base of operations as he worked on a way to find a way to defeat Bill. The plan was to never stay there doing nothing until the food ran out like we saw Stan with the other survivors doing. It was supposed to just be a safe place to retreat as they worked out a way to stop Bill. Ford on his own could have been there and lasted for a good while if he was the only one eating the food, as he got ready to take Bill down and plan his attack. And with his family out of the town and protected by the barrier, he did not have to worry about them. That is the genius of this idea if this theory is true. Ford sends his family out on a road trip after the mystery shack is bill proofed while he figures out how to fix the rift. That way, if the rift does break, 
He can take refuge in the now bill-proof mystery shack and plot his next move with an ample amount of time and resources at his disposal, while knowing that his family would be fine because of the bigger barrier around Gravity Falls ensuring that Bill cannot get to them any more than they can get to him. And all of that theorized from one single retcon paragraph. Now, like with any fan theory based on minimal evidence, there are flaws to consider. First of all was that if Ford's plan was to use the time stand and the twins were gone to seal the rift, then he sure didn't do a good job of that. Instead, he spent a writing in Journal 3 about how he was going to do it and it was going to involve Dipper. Basically, he was laying the groundwork for the events of Dipper and Mabel vs. the future, and offering him the chance to stay with him. So essentially, it throws his entire theory out of the window. Yeah. <laughs> But hey, it's an interesting idea to consider and what theorizing about Gravity Falls was always about. You'd have hits and misses. Sometimes you'd nail your guesses, and other times you would be way off. And personally, I think if nothing else, this gives Gravity Falls' most polarizing episode a little chance of redemption and gives a character who didn't appear in it the biggest role behind the scenes. Stanford may not have been in Roadside Attraction, but the episode would never have even happened had he not asked Stan to go out on that road trip. And love it or hate it, that's now an honor that he has and will never be taken away from him. But anyways, this was a rather random video. Um, I hope you liked it even if the dairy didn't actually mean anything. <laughs> but yeah, proper content coming soon to the channel, hopefully. Um, maybe, please hope I survive finals. Hope you enjoyed this uh, little video and uh, thanks for watching. Uh, bye! And the reason we don't see him is because he spent the entire time trying to find a solution to the rift. Now of course, we gotta be real for a sec, as what we basically are seeing here is a classic case of a retcon. You hear that? You hear that noise? That was my upstairs neighbor. I swear to fucking god every single fucking time I turn this fucking mic on, this fucking piece of shit turns this fucking drill on. Ugh. Either that's or a fucking siren on the outside. I always pick the worst, it's like my, mi my microphone is a fucking magnet for loud noises that start the second I press the record button.